everyone again. Welcome back. This is lecture number six. We're going to talk about RNA-directed RNA synthesis. First, a little bit of RNA history. 1935, now tobacco mosaic virus, remember the first virus discovered in the end of the 1800s? 1935, a scientist named Stanley, he crystallizes it. And, you know, the crystals are made of protein. They have 5% RNA in them, which you see the next, <laughs> the next uh, bullet, 1936. And guess what? Stanley said, ah, it's a contaminant. It's irrelevant. It's the protein that he thought the protein was the th actually he thought the protein was infectious, which now we know happens for other things called prions. But he this is a virus and the RNA was what was the infectivity. 1944, DNA is shown to be genetic material. We talked a little bit about that. 1952, the Hershey Chase experiment showing that the DNA of a uh, bacteriophage is the genetic material. Structure DNA solved in 1953. This is a banner year for science, folks. Structure of DNA. And I was born that year. So that's why I became a scientist, because it was a year that the structure of DNA was, was solved. 1956, of course, the Frankel-Conrad experiment showing that the tobacco mosaic virus RNA is genetic material. And then by 1959, lots of RNA viruses were discovered, uh, the RNA in those viruses, that is. And then in the 60s, people said, how does this RNA reproduce? And that's the topic of today's um discussion, how is that viral RNA reproduced? So today we're going to talk about uh, three different kinds of RNA-containing viruses, class three that have double-stranded RNA, class five with negative strand RNA, and class four with plus RNA. The one class here, six, plus RNA with the DNA intermediate, we're going to reserve that for another time because that gets its own lecture. So how were uh, RNA polymerases identified? RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, that's the word I'm going to use for viral enzymes that copy viral RNA. And so what people did, they infected cells with a virus. And then at different times after infection, they cracked the cells open, made a cell extract, and then they added the four triphosphates you need to make RNA, ATP, UTP, GTP, and CTP. Uh, and they also added, one of these was radioactive because in those days we used radioactivity. You don't use it much anymore. Uh, and then they would incubate this and they measure RNA synthesis. And that's one of those early results is shown here on this graph. So we're looking at hours after infection. And here on the left is RNA polymerase activity. And this is the amount of radioactivity incorporated into RNA. And on the right is the virus titer in PFU per mil. This is an experiment with polio virus. And you can see uh, between two and three hours after infection, you start to see RNA being made. And at the same time, virus is being made as well. So that was the first evidence that there is some activity in cells that can make RNA. And if you do this in uninfected cells, you don't see anything. There's no incorporation into RNA because cells uh, don't do this. They don't make RNA from RNA. So that was a... RNA polymerase in an infected cell. Subsequently, a RNA polymerase was discovered in the virus particles of negative strand RNA viruses. So Baltimore, he reasoned, remember Baltimore of the Baltimore scream, he reasoned, well, these plus RNA viruses, they don't have to have a polymerase in the particle, but the negative strand ones do. So he set out to look for it and he found it in VSV. And then finally, when we got the ability to sequence viral genes, we could see the sequences of these polymerases. And there's a, a signature amino acid, triplet GDG, uh, gly asp, asp, which is a signature for the active site, as you'll see. So if you have what you think is a polymerase, you can just look for this, confirm it. Then you can, of course, make the protein uh, from the DNA and show that it has activity. And now, of course, we have many crystal structures, three-dimensional structures of these polymerases.
So there's a relationship between the, the polarity of the RNA and whether or not there's a polymerase in the particle, right? Negative strand RNA genomes, the particle, contains the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and the RNA is coated with protein. We call it a nucleocapsid, here for VSV, here for influenza. The RNA protein complex is the nucleocapsid. This is negative strand, so it has to bring in a polymerase with it, right? Because if a negative strand gets in a cell without a polymerase, nothing will ever happen. It'll get degraded because there's no polymerase in the cell that could copy it. In contrast, plus strand RNA genomes, there's no polymerase in the particle. It's not necessary. The RNA is typically naked. It gets in the cell and it's translated immediately. There are two exceptions to that, the naked part. They're retroviruses and coronaviruses. Their plus strand RNA is coated with protein. And there's specific reasons for that. Uh, here, here, for example, is a poliovirus with a naked plus strand in RNA genome, a flavivirus, naked plus strand. But here, coronaviruses, the RNA is coated with a nucleoprotein. It's not naked. There's no polymerase in the particle, but the RNA is coated. Probably because it's so long, it needs to be protected. And then retroviruses are coated with a protein. And that's probably because the RNA has to be reverse transcribed when it enters a cell. And then finally, the double-stranded RNA virus genomes. Remember, the double strand has a plus strand in it, but it's inaccessible to the ribosomes once it gets in a cell. So these particles have to have an RNA polymerase in them as well. Even though there's a plus strand in that duplex, they cannot be translated, so the polymerase has to make messenger RNAs. And nucleocapsids, uh, again, the nucleocapsid is the RNA protein complex. It's a substructure within the particle. We've talked about this for VSV. It's an envelope virus with a nucleocapsid of RNA and protein. It's a negative strand RNA and a single nucleocapsid protein that's wound around in a helical structure. Here is the structure of the nucleocapsid protein. We've seen this before. And the RNA bound to it, this uh, molecule here. And this is the actual uh, three-dimensional structure of a uh, part of this nucleocapsid, and you can see one subunit of the protein, nuclear protein is in dark blue here, and you can see it's wound around in a helix. And then influenza viruses as well have a nucleocapsid, the RNA protein complex within the membrane. Uh, this is arranged as shown on the right here. There's the polymerase protein, and then the nucleoprotein is the orange spheres wrapped around the RNA. That's the structure of the nucleoprotein there, and the RNA binds in a groove in it very much like the VSV situation. And on the bottom is, bottom is the three-dimensional structure of the actual nucleoprotein or nucleocapsid of influenza virus. Here is, is we're looking at the end, and here we're looking at a side view. And that blue, again, the dark blue is a single protein, a nucleoprotein. So you can see how they're repeated in a coiled fashion to make up the NP. Now remember that RNA is not just a line. We draw it as a line in all of our diagrams but it's highly structured. And we will talk about some of these structures uh, during this course. RNA can be base paired. It can be base paired in a what's called a stem loop, where the stem consists of residues that are complementary. So they form this base pair. There's often a loop at one end. These can be complicated. They can be multi-branched. There can be interior and bulges and so forth. Uh, and there can be something called a pseudonaut, which is one of my favorite. I just love this idea that <laughs> this is, it looks like a knot, but it's not really a knot. So it's a pseudonaut. How many times can you say not in the same sentence, right? And so that's what this is. You have a stem loop structure. And then the bases in the stem, these red lines, can base pair with bases downstream of the stem loop. All right. So when that happens, you get what's shown in the next panel. And then it actually twists around itself, which is in the third panel. This is the actual three-dimensional structure of this. So that's what it looks like. And it looks like a knot, but it's not. So that's why it's called a pseudo-knot. These are important for protein RNA interactions. And we've shown you this five prime region of HIV-1 RNA, which is full of these stem loop structures with all kinds of functions that we're going to talk about in this course. I want to talk about RNA synthesis in general first. Two general rules. First, the RNA genome has to be copied from end to end with no loss of sequence. You can 
make mRNAs that are shorter than the genome. But if you want to make more genomes, they have to be complete copies of what comes in with the virus. Otherwise, you can't make a new virus particle. So end to end. And you also have to make mRNAs that can be translated, right? For some viruses, as you know, or as we'll see, the genome is the same as mRNA. So poliovirus genome is an mRNA. Uh, but for others, it's not because negative strand viruses can't be an mRNA. So mRNAs have to be made. We're going to explore those mechanisms today. Now, RNA, directed RNA synthesis has some universal rules. Here is how it works. Shown here in black is the template. That's what's going to be copied and the template, of course, has two chemically distinct ends, a five prime and a three prime end, we call them. And the polymerase reads the template in a three to five prime direction. All polymerases do that. And they synthesize a complement of the template in a five to three prime direction, always that way. And here you see an RNA polymerase, which is bound to the template, and it's using a primer to start. And this primer is, is complementary to the template, of course. It's shown in red. And the polymerase will add bases to the three prime end of that primer, depending on what's on the template, of course. So synthesis initiates and terminates at specific sites. Sometimes the polymerase initiates de novo, which means it doesn't need a primer. And our cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the one that makes mRNAs, it, it doesn't need a primer either. Sometimes the RNA polymerases do require a primer and you need other viral and cellular proteins typically in order to carry out this process. As I've already shown you, RNA is made by a template-directed incorporation of NTPs. We copy the template in a three to five prime direction or we read it and we make the product in a five to three prime direct direction. So what's here is templated RNA synthesis, but in some cases there is non-templated synthesis. We're gonna see an example of that today. Initiation step, there are two ways you can initiate RNA synthesis. You can initiate what we call de novo. Again, that means without a primer. Again, you always start at the three prime end. And in this mode, the polymerase can just add an NTP onto the three prime end and just keep adding more. In many cases, the polymerases are primer dependent. Here's an example of that. We have a protein linked uh, primer where the uh, polymerase uses that and then adds the second, uh, the first base onto it. Or there can be a nucleic acid primer in the case of influenza virus, which we'll see today. The RNA primer actually has a little cap on it, and that's used to start synthesis. So depending on the polymerase, it may or may not need a primer. The mode of nucleic acid synthesis is universal, whether it be DNA or RNA. It was first figured out for DNA, and that's what's shown here. That's why the bases are T instead of U. But this also works for you. Again, the overall view of what's going on, we've looked at already. Here it is in the upper, upper left. And the mechanism by which bases are added is called the two-metal mechanism of polymerase catalysis. If you've taken a biochemistry course, you might have learned this. So here is a DNA polymerase reading uh, a template, of course, and synthesizing in a five to three prime direction. If this were an RNA polymerase, it would be very similar, except we would have U instead of T. So we have the template here on the right, which consists of a string of, of bases with a phosphate in between each one. And, and the bases, of course, are composed of a sugar, a ribose, and one of the four bases, G, U, A, or C. So here's our template. And the product here, which is going five to three prime, we've already put down a C complementary to the G. We've put down an A, and they're linked by phosphodiester bonds. And now here, the T is being added by the polymerase. So of course, what base gets put in is directed by the template, and that's an A, so you put in a T or a U if it were RNA. Uh, so here is the ribose part of it. That's the base, the T is the base. And then we have three phosphates, one, two, three, as we move away from the sugar. And the way these bases are added in the polymerase, as we will see in a moment, uh, there are two aspartate residues. That's part of the GDD that I mentioned earlier. Those two aspartates coordinate magnesiums, magnesium ions, which in turn uh, help coordinate 
the phosphates. And these phosphates undergo a series of nucleophilic attacks, which eventually liberates the last two phosphates and joins uh, the first phosphate uh, to the, to the uh, existing chain uh, in the base. So here we would have uh, this, this oxygen here and the phosphate from uh, the, the base that's being added is being linked to that by that reaction. So that's why we call this a two metal mechanism because these two magnesiums coordinate and help to get this base added via the phosphates. First question, which is a universal rule about RNA directed RNA synthesis? RDRP may initiate de novo or require a primer. RNA synthesis initiates randomly on the RNA template. RNA is synthesized in a three to five prime direction. RNA synthesis is always template directed. All right, what do we have? 89% said RNA polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer. That's correct. Uh, initiates randomly is not correct. It always initiates at a specific place. Uh, synthesized in a three to five prime, it's synthesized in a five to three prime and it reads the template in a three to five prime direction. And it's always template directed, not always. Sometimes it is not. You just go back to uh, one of the earlier slides where I say sometimes there is non-templated RNA synthesis and we're going to talk about that today. Let's take a look at the polymerases, the RNA dependent RNA polymerases. The structures of all of them have now been solved at uh, X -ray, by X-ray crystallography at high resolution. There are four kinds of nucleic acid polymerases. And they're all shown here. We have our RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is uh, the one we're talking about today. Then we have RNA dependent DNA polymerase, which is reverse transcriptase. It makes RNA into DNA. And we have DNA dependent DNA polymerase, which copies RNA, DNA virus genomes and our cellular genomes. And finally, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which makes messenger RNA and other kinds of small RNAs as well. They're very conserved. They seem to have arisen from a common precursor. Uh, they can be of different lengths, but they have common motifs as shown by the colors, like red is conserved among all of them and green, yellow, purple, etc. And they all fold in a similar way. They look like a right hand, which is shown here at the right here. And they have what are called fingers and a thumb domain and a palm. And the palm is where the action happens. That's the act active site. That's where the polymerization occurs. And we're going to investigate that today. And the fingers and the thumb sometimes touch, as shown in this picture. So the poliovirus pol polymerase, which... Uh, RNA, RNA polymerase, uh, and others of that sort. The fingers and thumb touch, so it makes an encircled active site. There's the active site there in yellow, by the way, yeah, the strands. But the other polymerases, of which examples are shown here, they, they don't touch. Nevertheless, they do have an active site. So in all these pictures, I'm going to show you the active site. is shown as yellow. And some of these other motifs are colored like the red one and the green one and so forth. But the yellow is really important. That's where the polymerization occurs. And depending on the kind of virus uh, polymerase, right, a positive strand polymerase, a double-stranded virus polymerase, a negative-stranded virus polymerase, or even reverse transcriptase, HIV-1, you have a slightly different series of amino acids in the active site. So GDD, glyasp, asp, is uh, the one that's found in, in quite a few of these, but sometimes there's variations on them. But basically the two aspartates coordinate the metal ions as I showed you previously. Let's take a look at the polio polymerase in some detail. Here it is, it's three-dimensional structure solved a number of years ago. The thumb and fingers are touching at the top, they're in blue, and they provide the structure of the enzyme. And then here is the active site, the two beta strands, and those two yellow atoms, which are shown with the side chains, the yellow amino acids, those are the two ASP residues which coordinate the metals. So the polymerization happens right in there. So the red part of this palm, that's the active site down there. Here's another view of the poliovirus polymerase to give you an idea of the topology of this reaction. And this is shown where the atoms are now shown as spheres. So we call this a space filling view. And here we're looking at down from the top of the polymerase. Uh, 
and there is a RNA coming in and being polymerized in this picture. So the RNA comes in the top of the polymerase here. It goes down into the active site, which is shown in yellow inside there. And then th these magenta colors are the two uh, aspartates. Actually, those are the, the metals that are coordinated by the aspartate. So a single strand goes in, and then it comes out the front as a double-stranded RNA molecule, which is then subsequently pulled apart. So that's the top view. If you look at the front, you can see the template going into the top. It curves around the active site, and then it's it's polymerized, and it comes out the front as a double-stranded RNA. And of course, it's a helix. It's helix and it's coiled. And there's one more channel. So we've looked at the entry channel and the exit channel here. There's one more channel, and that's for NTPs. That's on the back of this polymerase. So now we're looking here on the back view, and there's the top, and the front is on the other side. But there's an opening here, and that's where the NTPs go in. And they go into the active site. And they're always going in, by the way. There's no selectivity. All four of them whip in and out really quickly. And when the right one goes in, it stays. But, you know, there's no way for... You, for the enzyme to know when you need an A or a G or a C or a U, they all go in and out randomly really quickly. And only when the right one is, is there, right meaning it's complementary to what's next on the template, does it stay inside. A couple of interesting features of this polymerase. This, this one I really like. It explains why uh, RNA works, but not DNA to polymerize these, these uh, polymerases. This is the structure of UTP bound to the polio polymerase. And here's UTP, right? There are the three phosphates. There's the ribose. And there's the base, the ur uracil base. The, the chemical structure for formula is written out here uh, on the right. And um, so th there's the base, the three phosphates. And remember, RNA has two hydroxyls. And below is T, the analogous base to U, and that only has one hydroxyl. That's why it's deoxyribonucleic acid, right? Mm -hmm. And that hydroxyl is what discriminates this polymerase. So only UTP will work in this, not TTP, because uh, the, the RNA bases have a two prime hydroxyl. And if this were DNA, if this were T, there would be no hydroxyl here and wouldn't be able to base pair with this aspartate uh, in this red strand in the active site. So here are two aspartates in the yellow active site. And um, there's another aspartate on a neighboring strand here in red. And it's it's forming a hyd hydrogen bond. I think I said base pair, but obviously that's not right. It's, f it's forming a hydrogen bond with the two prime hydroxyl of the U. And if this were T, it would be nothing, no, no, no uh, hydrogen bond would form and it wouldn't work. That's why this polymerase discriminates. Now you can change this single amino acid and get it to use DNA bases. So I think that's quite remarkable. So we're going to talk first about some plus stranded RNA viruses in their modes of reproduction. We're going to talk about the picornaviruses, which are the plus strand RNA viruses typified by polio virus. There are also flavy viruses that you that are reproducing in the same way. West Nile virus, dengue virus, Zika virus, etc. So they have a plus strand RNA genome, which is a messenger RNA. It can be translated directly or it's replicated through a minus strand full length complement to get more plus strands. This minus strand, by the way, is thrown away. It's not used for anything except to make more plus strands. Seems like it's a waste and it should be used for something, but it's not. So if poliovirus, the viral genome, is mRNA. Viruses bind receptors, as we've discussed. They get into cells. The RNA is released. Here it is in the cytosol, and then ribosomes bind to it. And it's translated directly into proteins. Among the proteins made are the RNA polymerase and other proteins that are needed for that enzyme to work. And uh, they copy the plus RNA, make a minus strand, and then those minus strands are used to make more plus strands. Of course, early in infection, the newly made plus strands, they go back into the translation pool, as shown by this arrow 11 here. But once you have enough structural proteins made, you can start assembling capsids. And so some of these genomes will then assemble with the proteins to form a capsid in a process we'll talk about later. This whole reaction of making RNA 
occurs on membranous vesicles that are actually induced by viral proteins. These don't exist in uninfected cells. And RNA synthesis in general of viruses appears to occur on such vesicles. The, the topology of the vesicles are slightly different from virus to virus, but they all seem to require these vesicles uh, to, to do these RNA synthesis reactions. So here is a very simple scheme. The genome is the same as mRNA. If every time you make mRNA, you're also making a genome. Here's the viral genome just to see how it's put together. It's a single plus strand of RNA, 7,440 bases in length. And it is uh, translated into a single long protein. There's one open reading frame here in this RNA. There's five prime and three prime untranslated regions. There's also a protein linked at the five prime end. And we'll explore that in a moment. But this long protein is processed by proteases to give you capsid proteins, the VPs, and to give you the polymerase, which is down here called 3D Paul, and the two proteases, 3C uh, and 2A. Those are the proteases that chop up uh, this protein. This is a common theme in, in viral genomes that you need a protease to process proteins. At the very five prime end of the RNA, there's a protein called VPG linked 22 amino acid protein. It's a viral protein that is uh, linked by a phosphodiester bond to the first base in the RNA, which happens to be a U. And then this is the rest of the genome here. Uh, that protein, as you'll see, is a primer for RNA synthesis. The entire genome looks like this more realistically. There is a clover leaf structure at the five prime end comprising three uh, stem loop structures. There's another stem loop somewhere interior called the cis-acting RNA element, and this can be in various parts of the genome. And then there's a pseudo knot at the three prime end. And these structures make sure that the RNA polymerase only copies viral RNA and not cellular RNAs, because in a virus-infected cell, cellular RNAs are never copied, never even though you have a ton of polymerase around. And we think these signals are needed for copying of viral RNAs. The first thing that has to happen is to make the primer for RNA synthesis. The primer is VPG with two U's on it. And that's going to be used by the polymerase to copy the viral RNA. And the way it's made is that the Cree element, the Cree, this stem loop, which is somewhere in the, the middle of the genome, uh, it binds a couple of polymerase molecules, three of them actually. Uh, and then this final one here comes in and VPG is brought in with it. And this loop, this Cree loop, by the way, has a stretch of A's in the top. And the polymerase simply reads those and attaches two U's uh, onto the VPG. So now this VPG can go and prime RNA synthesis. And that happens on membranes. Here's a membrane and the, the whole replication complex is attached to the membrane. And the, the synthesis occurs in a very unusual manner. So here's our, our clover leaf at the five prime end. Uh, it binds a cell protein called PCBP. And that binding allows uh, the polymerase to bind at the other side of the clover leaf. So here's a molecule of the RNA polymerase here. And in turn, the polymerase binds another cell protein, poly A binding protein, which, as you might guess, binds poly A. And what that does is bring the three prime end of the RNA next to the five prime end. It's kind of assembling the replication complex. Uh, then, of course, VPG UU, which is made at the Cree, comes in here. We don't know how it gets from the Cree to the three prime end. It's, see, the two U's are base bearing with the poly A. And then the polymerase is going to use that as a primer, which you can see in the next step. That's the priming step. We have polymerase and UU. And then the polymerase is going to start extending. It's going to copy the template, first a, a string of A's, of course, and then the heteropolymeric sequences until it makes a full length minus strand. So the VPG UU is the primer. You make a minus strand, and then you go through the same thing to make a plus strand. The next question is, which is a part of the poliovirus replication strategy? A, the production of subgenomic mRNAs. B, de novo without primer initiation of RNA synthesis. C, circularization of template for initiation of RNA synthesis. Or D, all of the above. Someone asked, where's the polymerase that makes the minus RNA from the plus RNA come from again? Right, so 
if it's not brought in with a particle, where does it come from? It's encoded and it's made when that first protein is made. And I'll show you that in a moment. 42% picked all the above, which is the wrong answer. Not all the above. So the production of subgenomic RNAs, no, there are no subgenomic RNAs. The genome is copied to a minus strand and then back to a plus strand. Uh, de novo initiation without a primer, no. So it's circularization only. I obviously did a poor job of teaching you. Sorry about that. Let's go back to um, where does the polymerase come from? <clears throat> so here's the viral RNA, comes in the cell. You can even go back further. The RNA comes in the cell, it's translated, right? And among the translation products is the polymerase, which is right here. <clears throat> the way you, you make all the proteins from this one RNA is to make a big protein and chop it up. You could make subgenomic RNAs, but that doesn't happen with this virus. Well, you'll see another plus strand virus where it does happen. Okay, so um, what else did I want to tell you? The polymerase comes from here, yeah. And so there's no subgenomic RNAs. The I forgot what the other quiz question was. <laughs> Let's see what it was that you all. No subgenomic RNAs, no, no, no without primer, right? The primer is VPG. And I showed you how the primer is hooked up to UU, so it definitely uses a primer. So it's only circularization. The other set of plus strand RNA viruses I want to talk to you about is one where a subgenomic mRNA is actually made. So anticipating the wrong answer in the quiz. These are alpha viruses, including Synbis virus, which I'm sure most of you have not heard of. Semleki forest virus, which most of you have not heard of, or maybe chikungunya you've heard of because the name is so cool, right? Chikungunya virus. Anyway, these are all plus-stranded RNA viruses. The genome is mRNA, but a, a, a subgenomic mRNA is made. So let's explore that. These viruses bind receptors. Viral genome is mRNA, but not all of it is translated. The RNA comes out of the cell. I, which I should say the genome comes out of the virus particle into the cell. It's part of it is translated to make the RNA polymerase, which then replicates that RNA, makes a minus copy on a membrane vesicle, makes plus copies from that to make more virus particles. But it also makes a subgenomic mRNA. So you can get the structural proteins made because initially only the RNA polymerase was made. And the structural proteins go on to help assemble the particle. Let's take a closer look. Here we have the viral genome. It is an mRNA. As soon as it gets in the cell, the polymerase is made. It makes long proteins that are chopped up by proteases. One of these is a protease. And you get the RNA polymerase and accessory proteins. So the polymerase can then copy this RNA, make a negative strand copy, and then it makes a subgenomic mRNA from that, from which the structural proteins are made. Now, you, you may ask why. Of course, I wouldn't answer a why question. <laughs> you, you could ask, what's the function of this? The function is that here at the end of NSP4, there's a stop codon. So translation cannot continue. And so an mRNA has to be made from a sequence here in red on the minus strand, so here's your subgenomic mRNA, and from that, the structural proteins are made. So subgenomic means shorter than the genome. I wish I could read the comments all the time. They're so amusing. Here we have very common in Brazil, chikungunya. Goes around every summer, mosquitoes, yes. The mosquitoes bring it around. We're gonna talk about chick later on when we talk about emerging infections. It's a very cool story. But back to RNA synthesis. You have to know the nuts and bolts first. Coronaviruses, we've, we've talked a little bit about these guys or gals. They get into the cell, they're plus-stranded RNA. The RNA is translated, but not the whole RNA is translated, only part of it, but enough to make the RNA polymerase. And the polymerase can go on and make new genomes through, as you might guess, a minus-strand intermediate. The new genomes can get packaged into new particles. The polymerase also makes mRNAs because not all of the initial RNA is translated. Let's take a look at that. It's pretty interesting. 
Here is inside the particle of the genome, 30,000 bases of RNA plus stranded. Here it is stretched out. And when this RNA gets into the cell, only the first third or so is translated. There is a stop codon after this 1AB protein. These two proteins are chopped up by proteases, and you get all the proteins you need to make RNA, including the RNA polymerase. But to get to the other proteins down here, which include important stuff like the spike and, and the nucleoprotein and many others, you have to make subgenomic mRNAs. And these are very cool. These are nested. What does nested mean? Well, one lies within each other, right? This, this little guy lies within the one above and above and above, etc. And nest in Latin is nido. And so the order name for these viruses is nidovirales. Isn't that nido? You know, I can't, I can't resist that. Yeah, matrosh, matrioshka mRNAs. Maybe that would be a good one. How are these made? This is brilliant. Here's, here's a, a diagram of mRNA synthesis. And here is the uh, viral RNA as it comes in the cell. And remember, the left half is translated to make the polymerase. And then here's the polymerase in gray, RDRP. It's binding to the three prime end. It's going to make some mRNAs. So it starts to copy the negative strand. And at some point, the five prime end of this genome kind of wraps around and it distracts the polymerase. So the polymerase begins copying it. And you end up with an mRNA, which is made complementary to a little bit of the three prime end of the genome, but then switches to the five prime end. And eventually it runs out of space here because this is the five prime end. And so you get this negative strand mRNA, which is not the whole genome. And then that's copied to make plus strands. Okay, and that's how you get those nested mRNAs because depending on how far the polymerase goes here at the three prime end, these are where all those nested mRNAs would be. If it goes short, you get the little ones. If it goes a little more, you get the bigger ones. And then wherever this jump occurs to the five prime end, that's the end. That's the five prime end of the mRNA. All right, and so that's how they make them. So this jumping is really interesting. Because that's how recombination occurs, RNA recombination. And we'll talk about this at the end of today. These viruses are really good at recombining. And that's why, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 is a recombinant for sure of a lot of different bat viruses that were circulating out there. And so they're really good at recombination and that gives them a lot of diversity. So this mechanism of RNA synthesis, which gives you the nested mRNAs, allows for high rates of recombination among these viruses. Very cool stuff. All right, let's go to negative strand RNA viruses. First, we have two kinds in general. We have viruses that have a single RNA. I call that unimolecular, and that's VSV, of course. And then we have segmented negative strand viruses like influenza virus. So the genome is negative strand, of course. Not It can't be translated, so we have to deal with that. So what do we do? Let's talk, talk about VSV first. The genome is not mRNA. It's obvious. It's negative stranded, right? When the genome is not mRNA, there must be a switch from mRNA to genome RNA synthesis. You'll, you'll get what this means in the moment. So VSV gets into the cell via endocytosis. The negative strand RNA gets in the cytosol. That RNA is coated with protein, including the RNA polymerase. It has to come in with the particle. Then the polymerase makes messenger RNAs. That's the first thing that has to happen. You have to make proteins make proteins, in this case, all the viral proteins. And some of these proteins can make a plus strand of the genome and a negative strand, which gets incorporated into particles. And some of these mRNAs will make the structural proteins. All right, so what, where's this switch? Let's take a look at that. Here's the genome. Remember, the particle is bullet-shaped, helical, nuclear capsid envelope. Here's the genome. And these are the mRNAs that are made from it. Five mRNAs that encode proteins, including the spike, which is called G here. L is the RNA polymerase. So these are for sure subgenomic mRNAs. And I think if you look at this, you can automatically figure out we have to have a switch to full length plus. Otherwise, if we just made mRNAs, we'd never make any more virus, right? 
So here's how it happens. The negative strand RNA comes in the cell. It is coated with protein. It's coated with nuclear protein, these little circles. It's got a polymerase attached to the end. That's this complex here of Paul and P proteins. You can see it in the virus particle there. The polymerase is attached to the three prime end. It then starts to copy the negative strand and it makes mRNAs. It makes all these individual mRNAs that will eventually get translated to make the proteins. But you can see at some point, we need to make more negative strands, right? How do you make a negative strand from a negative strand? You make a plus strand. So you can't make a negative strand from these mRNAs. They're not the whole, they're pieces, right? So at some point you have to have a switch from mRNA synthesis to full length plus strand RNA synthesis. And in the case of VSV, that is controlled by this protein called N, the RNA binding N protein. Early on in an infection, there's not a lot of N in around. So you make mRNA. And among those mRNAs is one encoding N here at the left end. And as soon as there's enough N around, it begins to coat the newly made mRNAs, and it causes it to the polymerase to make a full-length plus strand. It no longer stops between each mRNA, but makes a full-length plus strand, which can then be copied to a minus strand. All right, so it's the N protein that causes this switch, and how it happens is shown here. So this is the negative strand RNA. Here's the RNA polymerase. It is going to make that first mRNA the N gene mRNA, which is here. And then at the end of the N gene, there's this intergenic region. Polymerase reads it and stops. And that's the end of that mRNA. But the polymerase remains attached and it then makes the next mRNA, the P and then the M and then the L and so forth. So it starts and stops and starts and stops. And that starting and stopping is antagonized by the N protein coding the plus strand. So once there's enough N protein made, it will start to coat the newly made N mRNA here, but then it will not stop and it will continue along the whole way. So that's the switch. The other thing I want to tell you about is how polyadenylation occurs. So here's the intergenic region. Here's the uh, N gene up here and the next gene down here. And here's the mRNA that's just been made by this polymerase. It gets to the intergenic region where it stops. There's a stretch of U here and the polymerase gets confused, you know, as much as a polymerase can get confused and starts to slip and it keeps making A's because it's kind of stuttering at this U and copies them over and over and over again. And then after about 200 A's are added, if it's, it's had enough of that and it moves on to the next gene. So that's how you get your, M, your poly A tail, as you can see here on your mRNA, because there are not 200 A's encoded in this anthrogenic region. There are only seven. So it's this slippage and recopying that gives you the poly A. And then the polymerase stops and it reinitiates at the next mRNA. And again, that stopping and starting is antagonized by the N protein bound to the mRNA. All right, so that is a unimolecular negative strand RNA genome. And the question in the chat, the N protein inhibits the release of the nascent RNA. It will because it inhibits the termination. So the mRNA does not end. The polymerase keeps copying and makes a continuous plus strand, right? So there's, it won't fall off, that's right. So these, this is influenza virus, which is a negative stranded RNA virus, but it's in pieces, it's segmented. And again, when the genome is not mRNA, there has to be a switch. So we're gonna take a look at that. And I, I think you're looking at this and going, that's too complicated, but it's not really. And I don't expect you to memorize this. Why would you have to? You could always look it up, right? In the lecture notes, but I want you to understand it. The virus is coming in by endocytosis. And the, the low pH triggers fusion of the viral and endosome membranes. The RNPs are in the cytosol, and then they go into the nucleus. Here they are in the nucleus. They are then copied to make mRNAs. mRNAs have to go out in the cytoplasm to be translated. That's what we're seeing here. And then the viral proteins are made that are eventually going to give rise to new particles. We don't need to worry about that right here. But then, of course, these... Viral RNAs have to be copied to make more negative strands. So you go through a plus strand 
intermediate. And then you make negative strands and eventually they'll go out of the nucleus to be put into new virus particles. It's really intuitive, I think. How does this work? Here's the viral genome in pieces, eight pieces that encode eight mRNAs. Um, most of these encode one protein. Some of them encode a couple of proteins by different reading frames. In the case of these two, by splicing gives you a different RNA. But the point is uh, you have mRNAs that correspond to each negative strand, and that's how you can get proteins. Let's take a look at one in some detail. So here is our negative strand genome RNA comes into the cell, comes in with a polymerase, and you have to make mRNA from it. Otherwise, you'll never make proteins. And the polymerase for influenza virus requires a primer, and the primer is a capped piece of RNA. It's actually a capped primer stolen from the host. Call this cap snatching because what the uh, polymerase does, it takes host mRNAs and it cuts off the five prime end, the cap plus 10 to 13 bases, and that is used as a primer to make mRNA by the polymerase. So every viral mRNA has at its five prime end some cellular sequence, nonspecific. It could be from any cellular mRNA, but that's what the different color is meant to uh, signify here. Now, the polymerase makes an mRNA from each segment, but it doesn't actually copy the whole segment. It stops about 20 nucleotides short and then polyadenylates it. And you may be saying, why does it do that? No, not why, but what's the function of that? And I will tell you in a moment the reason why or the function for stopping. Uh, but to finish off this uh, scheme here, we have to, of course, make more negative strands at some point. And to do that, we need a full length plus strand, one that doesn't have some host sequence at the end because we know the viral RNAs do not have host sequence. And more importantly, we cannot lack these 20 nucleotides at the three prime end. So again, the nucleoprotein is the catalyst. When nucleoprotein levels rise to sufficient levels in the host cell, the uh, initiation occurs without a cap. It's just initiated de novo with an A. That's what nucleoprotein can cause. And then the copying goes all the way to the five prime end of the negative strand. So you make a complete plus copy, and now you can use that to make more genomes. So again, the NP is the key to this switch between mRNA and genome synthesis. I want to, and I, I did move some of these slides out of order. My apologies. I decided just an hour ago that it wasn't logical the way it was. <clears throat> Sometimes that happens. So uh, this slide was originally later. I think it makes more sense to go over this first. This is the mechanism of priming. So here is the negative strand genome. It's just a very three prime N. And here is a host mRNA that's going to be cleaved by the viral polymerase to provide this primer for priming mRNA synthesis. So host mRNAs are capped. They have a, a, a base at the five prime end, which is a five to five prime uh, linkage instead of a five to three prime, and that protects the mRNA, makes it more translatable and it's methylated and so forth. We'll talk more about this next time. So the, the viral polymerase complex cleaves these mRNAs of the host to give about a 13 base primer, and then that primes the polymerase to make mRNA. So you see the, the base pairing occurring here, and here, the polymerase has now used the primer from the host to elongate, and now we have the mRNA at the bottom here. So that's how the cap snatching works, the priming by capped fragments of host mRNAs. Now, the polymerase is a multi-subunit complex. Uh, here, you can see its three-dimensional structure and, and space-filling model, and at the bottom, just a hand-drawn picture. You can see it has a PA subunit in uh, let's see, what is that? Magenta, I guess. We have a PB1 in cyan and a PP2 in green. And these all have binding sites for RNAs. Uh, there is, and in fact, they have different functions. Um, the, the PB1 is the endonuclease that actually uh, catalyzes the cleavage. I'm sorry, the PB2 is the endonuclease. 
So what happens is we have our viral negative strand genome RNA, which needs to be copied. Uh, that uh, binds to the PB1 su subunit via a specific sequence at its 5 prime N, you can see there. At the same time, the cellular capped mRNAs that need to be cleaved, they bind to the endonuclease, which is PB2, which you can see there. And eventually they're gonna be cleaved as shown down here to make the primer for RNA synthesis. If it turns out that um, the wrong RNA uh, binds to the PB1 subunit, the endonuclease will never be activated. So say, let's say for example that uh, the three prime end of this RNA that's bound is the, is the wrong sequence. The endonuclease will not be activated because in order for PB1 to be active, both five and three prime ends have to bind and they have to be the right viral sequence. And that ensures that the endonuclease is, is activated and the, the mRNA is cleaved and then you get initiation and elongation by the mechanism I just told you. So it's a very carefully orchestrated procedure to make sure that the right RNAs get copied. I want to now tell you why the mRNAs all miss three, 20 nucleotides at their 3 prime N. Now let's go back and I'll show you that. Remember, each mRNA doesn't go all the way to the 5 prime end of the viral negative strand RNA. And this slide will explain that. So here's the polymerase complex. We have um, cleaved the, the capped message by the endonuclease. It's been used as a primer. Here's the active site of the enzyme. The viral RNA is in olive color, right? So we're copying from the three prime end, we're making a five to three prime messenger RNA. And the way this enzyme works is the enzyme doesn't move on the RNA, but rather the five prime end of the viral template is fixed. So we think that the polymerization pulls the template through the enzyme. So there's initially a, a loop here. And as the polymerization continues, it gets smaller and smaller until it can't be pulled through anymore because the five prime end is locked onto the PB1 enzyme. That's the catalytic subunit. And there it happens to be a stretch of U's. So the polymerase begins to stutter. It can't pull any more template through and it just continues to add A's until one or 200 A's are added. And then it gives up, falls off and you have a polyadenylated RNA. So that's why it's 20 bases short because that loop is about 20 bases. And then there happens to be a polyadenylation signal there. Kind of like the VSV, but different catalyst for uh, stuttering. Our next question is, how are influenza virus and VSV RNA synthesis similar? A, the switch from mRNA to genome RNA synthesis is controlled by an RNA binding protein. B, polyadenylation occurs at a short stretch of U residues. C, viral mRNAs are shorter than minus genome RNA or all of the above. Looks like we're stuck. Are we stuck at a stretch of U residues perhaps? So this time all of the above is right. Most of you got that, 74%. Everything's right. The switch from mRNA to genome is controlled by an RNA binding protein, right? The N protein binds the mRNA and allows it to be made without a cap primer. And it also allows it to go all the way to the three prime, five prime end of the virion RNA, the minus strand. Polyadenylation occurs at a short stretch of U. Remember this, the U where the RNA is pulled around the polymerase and the Viral RMIs are shorter than minus genome RNA. Everybody's right here. Everything is right. You could look at that actually. Here, right? So the mRNAs are short. The NP controls the transition to full length plus strands. Our last set of viruses are the double stranded RNA viruses. They're real viruses, multiple segments of double stranded RNA. Here's a double stranded RNA, just one for illustration. It has, of course, a plus and a minus strand. And, you know, as you'll see next time, messenger RNAs tend to be capped. And you see this, uh, this plus strand has a cap, which signifies that it could be a message if it were single-stranded, but because it's double, it's not, can't be translated. And so when these viruses come into cells, they have an RNA polymerase in the particle, which copies this double strand to make a, a messenger RNA so we can get protein made. But at some point, 
we need to make more genomes. And the genome is nothing other than a double-stranded RNA. So some of these mRNAs can actually be copied by the polymerase to fill in the minus strand and make more genomes. But how this happens is very interesting. I want to show you that. And again, the key here is that the plus strand is not accessible, so these viruses have to have a polymerase. And here again, the genome is not mRNA because it's not translated technically. So when is the switch? Let's see if you can pick it up. Virus particles come in by endocytosis. And remember, this virus is unusual in that it stays in the endosome when they fuse to lysosomes because the lysosomal proteases take off the outer shell and make a hydrophobic particle that penetrates out of the, the lysosome into the cytosol. So now you have this core particle, which has the double-stranded RNAs, and it also has the RNA polymerase in it. And this, these RNAs never leave the particle. This is an example of a virus where the RNAs don't come out. They stay in the particle, and the polymerase makes mRNAs inside the particle, and they come out of these turrets that are at each five-fold axis. They're now open by virtue of removal of the outer shell. mRNAs are made inside, and they come out, and you can see them coming out here, these little guys with, with their caps. And they're, of course, translated to make proteins, the viral proteins, and eventually you can build more particles. So you can build these particles shown in eight, which is the, again, the core basically with mRNAs in them. You now package the mRNAs in this new shell. So they're single-stranded right there. You've also put in that core, the RNA polymerase. And so it then makes them double-stranded. And eventually the outer shell proteins are added and these virus particles leave the cell. So I would say the switch is upon packaging the mRNAs because they're no longer translated. They're now going to be made double-stranded. The switch to genome synthesis, and that occurs at this step here, nine. So this is why there are two shells, as we mentioned last time, to protect the RNA inside. But then you need to take off the outer shell to allow the mRNAs made inside the core to come out. Now, a number of years ago, an investigator uh, actually solved the structure of these cores making, in the process of making mRNA, it was done by cryo-EM. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. I've jumped ahead. These are the particles with all the double-stranded RNAs in them. And here's uh, the core, which the outer shell is removed. The turrets are now open so the mRNAs can come out. And these are the 12 mRNAs, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 mRNAs for real viruses. Some of these have 12. And they, from each is made an mRNA and from those are made one or two proteins, as you can see. And again, these mRNAs are made inside the particle. And the polymerase uh, is within the particle. So here's the image. This is a cryo-EM image of the release of uh, mRNA from, in this case, rotavirus, another double-stranded segmented RNA virus. Inside is the RNA. This is the core particle. These are the turrets here. And the pink the pink is the RNA that was visualized by cryo-EM. There's RNA coming out of each five-fold axis, each turret. So the idea is the RNA inside is being copied to make mRNA. Then it comes out. The, here's, a, here's a pentamer, right? One, two, three, four, five. And you know structure, so you would find hexamers here. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Because this is a bigger particle. And here the RNA is coming out at each five-fold axis. There it's capped and the mRNA is shown in gray. And th the idea is that there is an RNA polymerase at, sitting underneath each turret at each five-fold axis, and that can make copy those genomic RNAs uh, in the minus strand and make mRNA, and it gets extruded. Now, how many five-fold axes of symmetry are there in an icosahedral particle? I hope you're saying 12. Exactly. 12. <laughs> but you put a question mark. You should have said 12 exclamation point. I have we have never found a double-stranded RNA virus with more than 12 segments. Probably because you have to have a polymerase at each five-fold axis. So you can't have more than 12 polymerases. And one polymerase copies each double-stranded segment to make these mRNAs. That's the idea there. That's neat, isn't it?
last thing I'm going to talk about is really important because it's about the origins of diversity among RNA viruses. And, you know, the reason SARS-CoV-2 was able to jump from bats to humans because was because of diversity. The reason the virus is apparently changing and variants are being made that appear to be less well neutralized by antibodies is because of the mechanisms we're going to talk about right now. There are two main origins of diversity among RNA viruses. First, misincorporation of nucleotides. All polymerases, all four classes of polymerase that we talked about earlier, they all make mistakes. The nucleotides go in and, you know, only the right one is supposed to base pair, but sometimes the wrong one base pairs and you get an error. And the RNA polymerases, the RDRPs, can't fix the mistakes. DNA polymerases can fix them, but RNA-dependent polymerases can't. Neither can a reverse transcriptase. The lack of proofreading ability causes the error rate of RNA viruses to be very high. One misincorporation per 1,000 or 10,000 nucleotides polymerase. So that gives you an average error frequency of 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000 nucleotides polymerase. So in a 10,000 base RNA virus genome, if you have a mutation frequency of one in 10 to the four, every time the genome is copied, you have one mutation. So if you make 10,000 new genomes in an infected cell, and you make many more than that, 10,000 genomes, you've mutated every base. Okay, that's why mm -hmm. RNA viruses are the masters of mutation. And if you see, again, a headline that says the coronavirus is mutating, you should laugh at it because as I said to a reporter, it's like writing a headline, the earth is round. There's nothing to that, right? Coronavirus is mutating. They always mutate in every cell. So this is a problem in a way, but it's good because it allows RNA viruses to vary much more so than DNA viruses. The exception, and it, here's the exception to this, the lack of proofreading activity in the polymerase. So DNA polymerases have a separate protein that fix the mistakes that the polymerase makes so the error rate is far, far lower. But there's one exception in the RNA world, that's the nidovirales. They have a protein called XON, which is a exonuclease. An exonuclease chews the end of RNA from the three to five prime direction. And it, if it senses an error, it cuts it out and the polymerase fixes it. So this is an error correcting protein. And here's how we think uh, it works. NSP14 is the, this XON protein. That's the exonuclease. And all these other proteins are accessory proteins and the RNA polymerase that is needed for uh, polymerization. And you can see there's a primer here and we're copying a template. So 14 is poised just downstream of the polymerase. So if the polymerase makes an error... NSP14 will fix it. So someone asked, I thought SARS-CoV-2 had a unique proofreading protein. Yeah, it's XON. This is it. <laughs> I'm telling you about it. Yes, and so drugs that are mutagens, that are base analogs, are tough to make because XON will pull it out as soon as it goes in there. And remdesivir is one of the few that actually work to mutate the genome. But it's hard to make an antiviral that's a nucleoside analog. And we will talk about that later on in detail. Anyway, so this uh, is important. If you take out XON, you can actually make an infectious virus. But this virus will have a 15 to 20-fold increase in its mutation rate. And it's not very fit. It will not compete well in competitions with wild-type virus. What's the reason that nidovirales and coronaviruses are a subfamily in the nidovirales, okay? This may allow faithful replication of large genomes. I told you that the genomes of nidovirales can be up to 41,000 bases. That's huge for RNA, the biggest RNA genomes. And that's probably because they have an error correcting mechanism. Otherwise, with a, such a large genomes, you would have too many errors to sustain them. Just think of this, the next biggest genome of an RNA virus and that, that doesn't have a, an error correcting protein is about 12,000 bases, much, much smaller. So if you want to get big, you need to have uh, error correction. So they still make errors though. They're just a little bit lower than most RNA viruses, but 
you know, every time SARS-CoV-2 goes in you, in every cell, it's making errors, lots of errors. We have begun to understand what controls the error rate of polymerases. And in the poliovirus RNA polymerase, a major fidelity checkpoint has been identified. In other words, a point at which some errors can be detected. Now, this <clears throat> fidelity of polymerization, which is basically what we're talking about, making mistakes or not, is determined by how the template, the primer, and the uh, NTP interact at the active site. So here, to show you again, this is UTP bound to the polymerase, but it's, I'm going to use it to illustrate my point. Here's the, the two aspartates in the active site. So that's where polymerization would occur. Here's the triphosphate in the active site. What happens is, as I told you, these, these NTPs come in the back channel of the polymerase in and out very quickly. And no matter what base is in the template in the active site, all four of the bases can come in. And if the wrong base comes in, it will bind in a way that doesn't allow the ribose here to interact with these two aspartates. If you remember way back, we talked about how the, the two aspartates coordinate metals, which coordinate uh, the, the phosphates, and the ribose is also involved with that. So the, the incorrect base pairing uh, doesn't have the right interactions with, with this ribose. But if it's correctly base paired, if the right base is in and it correctly base pairs with the template, there's a, a big conformational change in the enzyme. It reorients the triphosphate. And now you have good interactions with the two aspartates and polymerization occurs. So most of the time, the enzyme can sense when the wrong triphosphate is in the active site because it doesn't make the right bonds with the aspartate. But not all the time. Again, one in 10,000 or one in 100,000 times, it doesn't pick up the mistake. But most of the time it does. And, you know, the whole enzyme changes in response to the, the triphosphate sitting in here. So it's quite interesting. We think that this is probably a universal mechanism. Now here is how this is controlled in the polio polymerase. So a number of years ago, a single amino acid change was identified, a glycine to serine at position 64 in the polymerase. Here's the polymerase here. That's the G64S in orange. And the active site again is here in the right in yellow. This makes fewer errors. A single amino acid change makes a polymerase that makes fewer errors. And what it's thought to do, it slows these conformational changes that occur on base pairing with the NTP, right? So that, that base pairing that has to occur when the right NTP goes in, the whole conformational change that mediates that is slowed by this amino acid change, which is quite far away from the active site, but nevertheless, it can control what happens in the active site. So this is in the fingers domain, it's remote, but it makes the enzyme more dependent on correct base pairing, right? So before, you know, you could get away with some incorrect base pairing in the active site, that would be your error. But because of this change, it makes it harder to, to make those conformational change on, on incorrect base pairing. And so you have to have the correct base pair and you get a higher faith, a higher fidelity polymerase. It's really remarkable that one, one amino acid change can do that. And we'll revisit this again when we talk about evolution. It has some interesting experiments around it. Um, other RNA polymerases seem to have similar residues that can be changed and improve fidelity. Now, these viruses don't exist in nature. We make them in the lab. And the reason they don't exist in nature is they can't compete. They have less fitness because variation is important for fitness. The other source of, of um, diversity in RNA viruses is RNA recombination. And again, we've already seen this in the coronaviruses. If a polymerase is copying one RNA here, it's the polymerases in purple. If another RNA happens to be near to it in those replication complexes, which is often the case, the polymerase may switch templates and you end up making a hybrid RNA. So that's a recombinant RNA. It's exchange of nucleotide sequences among different genomic molecules. These are typically two of the same uh, kind of virus infecting a cell. But they have, if they have different nucleotide sequences, which every RNA does, as you will see, then you can distinguish the recombination. This recombination has, has rearranged RNA genomes, created new ones. So it has shaped the RNA virus world for sure. And as I said, it's, it's very high frequency in coronaviruses. In poliovirus, up to 20% of RNA molecules can recombine in a single 
replication cycle. So this is another high frequency source uh, of diversity. And we'll revisit this again, mutation rates and RNA recombination when we come to evolution. And as you might guess, this is also controlled by the polymerase. A single amino acid change in the polymerase from leucine to alanine at 420. Now, far away from G64S, here's L420A. That single change reduces recombination frequency of the polymerase. And this is the thumb domain here. This is right near the RNA exit channel. So the RNA would be coming in here and curving around and going out here. And we think that this change reduces the initi initiation rate of the polymerase and the stability of the elongation complexes. So it's not so easy for the polymerase to change templates. They're likely to fall off. So they're more likely to stay on the same template. No effect on fidelity, actually. Uh, so the, the fidelity is controlled on the other side of the molecule. This controls recombination. And the two actually work together. And we'll again explore that when we talk about uh, evolution. Next time, we're going to talk about transcription and RNA processing. That is a event that happens in cells uh, that are infected with DNA viruses. So we're going to move into the DNA virus world. Mm -hmm.